Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human. This is Brian Sanders. I'm back once again to tell you to start back at episode one. Listen to all the old episodes. Go backwards if you want. Start from one, whatever you want to do. Share with family and friends. That's what we need most. I'm not going to do much of an intro for this episode or talk about nose to tail because I got too much going on. Everyone knows about nose to tail already. Just wanted to update everyone about the Food Lies film. I'm hard at work all day, every day. It is a struggle. The Sapien Center, we're finishing construction, another struggle. And nose to tail, another struggle. Getting all this meat out with the hot weather, trying to keep products in stock. So much going on. I need to get back to work. So I just wanted to say, support me. Go to nose tail.org, go to sapien.org, get on the newsletter, and follow me on Instagram at food.lies or wherever else on social media. Check out the intro to the film on the Food Lies YouTube channel. Give us a review on iTunes. That would be huge. Wherever you listen to your podcast, give Peak Human a review. That would help a lot. Give us some more street cred. Share with family and friends. And that's about it. Today, my podcast is with Dr. Anthony Chafee, who is a beast. He is an all-American rugby player. We kind of breezed through that part. But he is a strong, healthy guy. He's doing the Lord's work. He is a neurosurgeon. He is doing all kinds of amazing things, and he happens to be a carnivore man. So my podcasts have been a bit all over the place lately. We've talked to some pro-metabolic people about introducing carbs, and now we're back to all meat. As I say in the podcast, I'm just an observer in all this. I'm sort of a communicator. I'm trying to put together information, get it out to people, and let them make their own choices. I'm doing what I think is best at the time. I'm eating animal-based 80% plus some fruit and some sweet potatoes and stuff like that. And it's doing great. But there's different diets for different people for different times of their life with different goals, with different problems around food, maybe past issues with food, dieting issues. So again, just listen to these episodes to try to understand more about the entire picture of health and then see what works for you, see how these puzzle pieces can all fit together. That's what I'm trying to do. Get it in the Food Lies film, get it out on the Food Lies YouTube and get it out on these podcasts. So a little bit more about Dr. Anthony. Dr. Chafee is an American medical doctor and neurosurgical resident who over a span of 20 plus years has researched the optimal nutrition for human performance and health. It is his assertion that most of the so-called chronic diseases we treat as doctors are caused by the food we eat or don't eat and can be reversed with dietary changes to a species-specific diet. He began university at the age of 15, studying molecular and cellular biology with a minor in chemistry at the University of Washington in Seattle, which culminated in an MD from the Royal College of Surgeons. Currently in Australia, he specializes in neurosurgery and does private consultations in functional medicine while thriving on a carnivore diet. I had a really great time talking to Dr. Chafee. We got to meet at KetoCon. We became fast friends. We talked for a while after the show. And man, this guy knows what's up. So whether you want to be pure carnivore or not, great episode. Tell me what you think. Enjoy this one. Hey, hey, Dr. Anthony. Oh, how do you say your last name? Chaffee? Chafee? Yeah, Chafee. Chafee. Oh, man, I should ask you. Yeah, that's all right. All right. Well, it was great meeting you in person. You were at KetoCon. I rolled up to you and Sean Baker, just two large men who eat meat. <laughs> yeah. It was great to, to see you in person. So you came over just for the conference? Yeah, yeah, that was it. So I was able to roll it into a, a trip to see my family up in Seattle as well, uh, which was great. Um, but uh, yeah, the main, the main purpose was to come back uh, for KetoCon. Awesome. Um, I did a presentation called Exposing the Trillion Dollar Agenda Against Red Meat. Uh, what was your presentation or what did you, you were on a panel as well? Yeah. So I did, I did a presentation uh, just called, you know, why we are carnivores. And I just, just made the case, you know, brought forward the evidence on any, any different metric you care to look at, you know, human beings biologically are carnivores. This is just the type of animal that we are. And, um, you know, so, so eating a carnivore diet is going to be optimal for us and, and why that's important, you know, because it's implicated in chronic disease, such as heart disease, diabetes, cancer, obesity, and especially like autoimmune diseases and even neurodevelopmental delays, such as autism or, um, you know, d- you know, dementia and Alzheimer's as well. So, uh, that was my main, my main talk. And then I was on yeah, the carnivore panel with, you know, Dr. Baker and, and, uh, uh Kevin Stock and, uh, nutrition with Judy and um, A. Day Fox and uh, uh, Laura Spath as well. So we had we were up there at the carnivore panel. People just asked uh, you know different questions to us. I love it. 
I know all those great people. Yeah. Uh, so tell us more about what you do on a daily basis. I understand you're a neurosurgery resident. Never talked to a neurosurgeon yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that, I mean, that's my, my day job is, um, you know, training in neurosurgery. Uh, it's very, very busy. You know, it can be, you know, a, a normal week would be, you know, like 90 hours easily. Uh, because we do a lot of on call and on call is very, very busy. So you're not just sort of sitting there waiting for something to happen. Like you're, you're dealing with things the whole time. So, you know, longest I've done is like 135 hours in a week. So it can, yeah, so it can range uh, between that. Yeah. So, um, and that would sort of roll into the next weekend because obviously you're working most hours of every day, uh, including the weekend to get, get to 135 hours. And so, and then you're just back in on Monday, which, uh, sucks, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is and I do enjoy it. So, um, that's my day job. And then I've just gotten into the whole diet and nutrition side of things just because I've seen what an impact it makes on people's lives. And I've, you know, tried to, to dig into the research to really see what we know and see what we can prove and, uh, and, and use that to try to help people. So I also do clinic work on the side. I have a, a private work, uh, clinic um, outside of neurosurgery where I just see patients and try to get them better, help them lose weight, help them, uh, you know, reverse diseases, get off medications and, 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 and prevent things from getting wrong in the first place. And uh, quite a big proportion of that is uh, put, try and get them on a carnivore diet or as close to it as possible. That's great. Well, maybe we can go into why we are biologically carnivore because I think it's, I don't, I hope I'm not messing with people's heads here because I'm kind of going back and forth between different guests and I'm, I am a very animal based person and I'm trying to be an observer in all this. And I'm, and I, I kind of, I love to be sort of convinced of different things and say, like, Oh, you know, let's explore all of these things. And I, I'm, on the same page as you 95% of the way, but I want to get into that last 5% today. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, tell us more about why we are biologically carnivore. Yeah. So, I mean, you can look at it from multiple different metrics, you know, but prob probably the most, uh, you know, convincing and, and hardest uh, of the evidence is you're know, looking at it from a paleoanthropological point of view and looking at the fossil record and looking at how, you know, our ancestors split off from other primates about 8 million years ago, you know, because they started eating meat and they started getting these adaptations, uh, that, that, uh, um, you know, was beneficial to that and was supported by that. So our teeth and jaws started getting smaller and our brain started getting bigger. Our muscles and mastication got a lot smaller as well. If you look at a gorilla's head, you might have a big head, if you look at the skull though, most of that is going to be the muscles of mastication, the, the, the uh, temporalis muscle there. That's, you know, working that big jaw with big teeth and big fangs, by the way, uh, in order to chew a bunch of plant material constantly. We stopped doing that because we're eating softer and softer food. We were eating, we were eating, you know, we're scavengers eating, you know, carrying animals, using rocks to break open the skulls of animals and get at the brains. Uh, and, and this was very, very nutritious. And so we had to obviously figure out ways of getting this sort of animal, animal source nutrition, uh, in, in sneaky sort of ways, because we didn't have claws and teeth like a big cat or a wolf. And so we had to use our brains and that's why we developed intelligence and that's why we developed tools. So, you know, because we, we couldn't outclass a mammoth by, by any physical metric. And so we needed to figure out fire and set fire to something and then scare them over a cliff and they would fall to the, you know, to their death. And then we would use stone tools to cut them up, get through the skin, cut up the meat and eat them and use fire to cook it eventually around probably 1.5 million years ago. So if you look at this, you know, our ancestors started getting, you know, bigger and bigger brains, smaller, smaller teeth, smaller jaws. And we started developing tools. We started uh, eating more and more meat. And then when the ice ages hit sort of two and a half million years ago or so, you know, this obviously wiped out a lot of the plant life and a lot of the animals that were supported by that plant life. And our ancestors were, were part of those who survived because they were already adapted to eating meat 
And really the only things that were surviving were these, you know, big uh, megafauna that could survive in these ice times. And then the predators that were preying on them, our ancestors included in that. And so it was that sort of shift over where they were really forced to go full carnivore that that really started, you know, putting our evolution towards our current iteration in hyperdrive. The first true human was about 2.4 million years ago, Homo habilis. And they were probably pretty close to full carnivores, if not completely carnivores. And after that, they were nearly full carnivores. There was, there was a big study put out by uh, Professor um, uh, Mickey Bendor out of the University of Tel Aviv. And, and he looked at a ton of different parameters. And he showed that you know humans have been basically pure carnivores for about at least 2 million years. And this lines up with that timeline with the, the, the ice ages, you know, people say, no, no, people probably moved towards the equator when these ice sheets were coming down. That's an assumption and it's wrong. Actually, you will find from the fossil record that as the ice sheets were coming down, people were moving up into the ice. You know, we had fire at that time. We could, we could tame the cold. And this is where the big megafauna was. And that's what, what, uh, they wanted to eat. So you can look at it, at, at it differently as well. We have something called the stable isotope studies. This is, this is, this is hard science. You know, this isn't just guesswork. So you can actually tell how close to the bottom of the food chain an animal is by, uh, it's, you know, the, by the stable isotope study, because if you're just eating plant life, you'll get a certain amount of this. And then you, you, an animal that eats that animal that eats plant life, they're going to get a higher concentration of that. Then there's an animal that eats the animal that eats the animal that eats the plant life and you get it concentrated, uh, even more. And this is how you differentiate the food chain, you know, and who's top of the food chain apex predators. And that's what this finds is that, humans were apex predators, top of the food chain. And that's something that, that really wasn't controversial up until very, very recently. That's, that's, I, I literally learned that as a child in school that, you know, humans, early humans were apex predators, top of the food chain. We ate every animal below us. You know, I can't think of this, you know, you know, I, I, I can't no, now think- it's, until it hurts someone's feelings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the, what the trouble is now, but people get, get very upset, you know, that thinking that like, no, 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 we were herbivores. How, how, how were we herbivores? You know, herbivores don't hunt generally. I mean, there, there actually are chimpanzees that hunt other chimpanzees and monkeys and things like that. But they, you know, that that's, uh, you know, still, uh, a rarity. Most herbivores just eat eat plant life. And occasionally, you know, maybe see a horse, like take down a, you know, a duck or something like that, which, which I've seen <laughs> pretty, pretty funny or like an elk, you know, uh, go after like a, a little like duckling or something like that. And you're just like shocked. Like, Whoa, did I just see that? And, um, but you know, you, you really won't see an apex predator graze. You know, you don't see great white sharks eating kelp for roughage. You don't see lions just, you know, sitting there munching on grass all day. You know, apex predators eat animals, you know, and that's, that's, that's just how it is. And so when we know by the stable isotope study that that's exactly what humans were doing, we had a higher carnivore rating than even other, uh, carnivores like lions, hyenas, wolves, and foxes alive at the same time in the same area, you know, because we were eating the lions, hyenas, wolves, and foxes, (laughs) you know, as well as everything else, you know? So that's just one of them. Also, we have, you know, forward facing eyes. This is very typical uh, eyes of the hunter. You know, you're, you're seeing this in 3d, uh, vision. You're able to like focus on, on your prey. Uh, whereas like prey animals, herbivores will have their eyes usually towards the side of their heads. And, and this allows them to, to look around and, uh, and watch for predators trying to come at them. Uh, we have a rotational shoulder. We can throw some. We can throw things very, very hard, very, very fast. You know, just the an average adult human male can throw, uh, you know, a baseball about sixty miles an hour. And obviously, if you train up for this, you can go a lot more. But a chimpanzee doesn't have that rotational capacity in their shoulder joint, and so they, they the maximum that they could throw this is probably around twenty miles an hour, and probably not very accurately. So that that's from hunting. You know, we're throwing rocks, we're throwing spears, we're throwing weapons to kill animals, to eat them, you know? And so, you know, that's, that's just something that's been well-established in, uh, in, in our history. 
uh, and and yet this is somehow being challenged now. You know, people say that oh well, you know, it's not natural because we don't have these big teeth and claws. We wouldn't be eating these animals. It's like you know, right? Well, you know, we don't have big teeth and claws like a lion because we don't kill things with our mouths. You know, we use tools. We use our brains, and that's why we live in houses and lions don't. And you know, I you know as cool as it would be to be a lion, like I'll, I'll take the house, you know? And, um, you know, so it, it, it doesn't really follow that we would, you know, be, be frugivores because we can just naturally pick fruit. You know, we can naturally throw a spear and throw a rock too. But what the difference between throwing a spear and throwing a rock and picking fruit is, is that you actually needed to develop intelligence in order to develop the spear and develop the rock and develop the tactics where you did not need to develop intelligence to pick low hanging fruit, you know? And so there wouldn't be any, any evolutionary impetus or drive to grow bigger brains, right? We would still be like other primates. We'd still be like the bonobo and the chimpanzee that eat, you know, fruit and, and mostly leaves and, uh, and small animals and insects, we would not have, have needed to develop the intelligence that we do now, but, but because we were going after animals, because we were hunting, because we were, uh, had to figure out tools and tactics, we needed to have our brain. So that, that's another thing. Um, just anatomically, just you look at our biology, you know, obviously we talked about teeth and you know, people say we have flat teeth just because they look sort of flat in the front. That's not actually what flat teeth mean. Flat teeth means that they're planar on the surface. And so they slide against each other like a millstone. Uh, and that's to, you know, mill fibrous plants. We have bicuspid teeth. If you clench your jaw and try to move your jaw around, it doesn't go anywhere. So that's not flat. They're stuck there, right? So flat teeth would be, would allow you to move them side to side and, and crush these, uh, fibrous plants. Then you go down into your stomach. We have very, very acidic stomach acid, probably like, you know, it's like one point, you know, around 1.4 pH, which is extraordinarily low. I mean, that's like, like vulture carrion animal low. Um, you know, like lions are around two cows are like six and other herbivores are around that as well. So we have a, a stomach pH in keeping with, you know, carrion animals or, or carnivores. Because of carnivores, people yeah, don't exactly. know that carrion is like the rotting meat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it was a high bacterial load, and we would need a high um, acidity level in order to kill that bacteria safely, so we didn't get get sick. Um, you know, and then we have a, a, a proportionately longer small intestine where we're absorbing all this uh, all this nutrition, and a proportionately smaller large intestine because we, we don't need that anymore. Other primates are called hind gut digesters. They have a, they have a much longer, uh, large intestine. They have a, have a very long cecum, uh, which is, you know, very, very long, several feet long. Uh, our cecum is an appendix that big, right? That's a vestigial organ, right? Because it, it hasn't been used as a cecum in millions and millions of years. Well, in hind gut digesters and other, other primates and other animals that, that do this, that's where fiber packs down and packs into so that they can extract the nutrients from that and the bacteria can break it down into short chain fatty acids and then the animal absorbs fatty acids, right? And so we haven't been doing that for millions of years. So that part of the intestine has shrunk down. You, our intestines are, are very, very high energy dependent. And so, you know, you're, you're not going to keep that around and keep running that run energy through it if, if that's not actually providing an advantage. So it provided an advantage to shrink that down because we weren't using it. And, you know, and, and the list goes on, you know, we, we can, we can break down meat very easily and absorb it very easily. We absorb about 98% of the meat we eat as long as we don't eat fiber because that gets in the way. As long as we're not eating plants that have uh, protease inhibitors and, and uh, other other sorts of nutrition blockers that stop our body from breaking these things down, stop our body from absorbing them properly. These all exist in plants and we don't have the defenses really against them. And uh, we don't have the ability to break down fiber. You know, all herbivores that, you know, predominantly eat fibrous plants have the ability to break down fiber and get most of their nutrition from that fiber. We do not have that ability anymore. And so, you know, again, this just, this just sort of shows 
that were not that were not herbivores that we in fact are carnivores and if you look anthropologically at all the different uh you know races of humans today that still exist and still live in a, in a natural fashion of, of you know stone age stone age nomads they're they're all carnivores you know nearly strict carnivores usually strict carnivores you look at the inuits going up north there aren't plants up there to eat even if they wanted to eat them and they don't and they do very very well there's plenty of studies going back 100 years that that have shown this very conclusively there are mixed studies that look at inuit as a people and say that oh some of them do get heart disease they're looking at the one they're not they're not differentiating between the ones that have actually moved to cities and are eating a western diet mm -hmm. and getting sick from from that that nonsense of course. yeah yeah exactly so you know but if you're looking at the actual diet and these people living in, in a natural way, you know, they're very, very healthy. They don't get heart disease. They don't get diabetes. They don't get cancer. You know, animals in the wild really don't get cancer. Animals in the zoo, when fed their natural diet, don't get cancer. And that's why there's signs at zoos and parks that say, don't feed the animals. You know, if they eat, so, if they eat what they, they don't normally eat, they'll get very sick, you know, but no one's putting a sign in front of, you know, our house saying, you know, don't feed the humans stuff they don't eat. This is crap. This is going to make you sick. But it's true. The same holds true for them as it does for us. And so we get the same diseases that the animals get if they eat, you know, the wrong thing. And, you know, they get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases, and arthritis. And dogs and cats, which are known carnivores, get the same things when given, you know, grain and plant-based kibble. And, and vets now are saying that, that animals uh, like, you know, pets, domestic pets like dogs and cats, have a huge increase in human diseases, you know, and, and they're not putting two and two together. They're eating a species inappropriate diet and they're getting, you know, damage from that. So these are just, uh, just some of the, of the many ways that, that we can show that we're, that we're carnivores. I think the stable isotope studies are, are, are very, very uh, conclusive though. I just was working on a graphic for that for the film and we animated that stable isotope study and show that humans are up at the top mm -hmm. and high trophic level carnivores. Uh, the Mickey Bendor study, yeah, he sent that to me a couple of years ago before it was printed or before nice. it got accepted. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. It has so many lines of evidence and it mm -hmm. basically all points to that we were high trophic level carnivores, which means, you know, top of the food chain, like you're saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great, great overview. You you got it all. This is kind of the first uh, episode of the film, the Food Lies series. Although it's not a carnivore film, it goes through everything you just said with all the scientists who've done the research. Dr. Brianna Povener was, you know, she's out there digging up the fossils, showing the cut marks on the bones from, you know, 2 million years ago, 3.5 million years ago when we started breaking open the the femurs to get the bone marrow and the skulls to get the brains got dr bill schindler explaining why our teeth and jaws got smaller and what, what that means and why it doesn't matter that we don't have fangs and claws because mm -hmm. yes we developed ways to you know get our food with our ingenuity and with uh, communication with our big brains and oh man that was amazing so <laughs> i guess the, the big question is though we can eat other foods though so this is so people may even accept all that and then they'll be like, yeah, but humans, you know, we're so adaptable. We we are omnivores. We live all over the world. We live near the equator. And so we have developed the ability to eat plant foods. So what do you say to that? Yeah, I, I, I guess that um, now, look, we, we are robust animals, you know, we we can survive on 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 you know, more than uh, meat, uh, which makes us like you say, very adaptable and very hardy. And I think this, this has absolutely uh, a lot to do with our success as, as a species. You know, we're the most successful species, you know, on the planet, certainly maybe, maybe ants beat us. I don't know. They, they're pretty, um, they're, they're pretty good at what they do, but you know, we, we, you know, have people on every continent, on every, every spot around the earth. Like, you know, we're there, you know, and, um, so, you know, obviously that, that gives us a, a big advantage being able to survive on things that like, you know, like a cat that, that they will basically any plant will kill felines. Right. And that's because their herbivorous past was so long ago, 
you know, dogs and canines, they're, they're a little closer that, you know, less things will kill them, but, a, the, but a lot more plants will harm or kill a dog than will kill a human. So, you know, we did come from an herbivorous past and so we still have some defenses and then some populations, you know, uh, Caucasians and, and, and some Asians, um, they would have, have had agriculture sort of around 8,000 years ago or so and have some adaptations to that. But that's not an immunity. We didn't then become herbivores or even omnivores, really. We just, we just are, have a little more defenses. And so, you know, if you look at like the Native American population, uh, and I, I mean, I remember learning as a kid that when eating a Western diet, Native Americans were four times as likely to develop obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, all the rest. And I remember thinking to myself, well, doesn't that mean the food is causing the disease? Because we eat the food and we get the disease, you know, and, and you know, just at a lower rate. Yeah. And when they, when they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease, right? So we're all getting the diseases, just some people at lower rates. So some ethnic populations can be, uh, you know, have more defenses to species inappropriate food, but it's not optimal for, for anyone. You know, plant food is not optimal for anyone. And I guess, you know, the idea of, of omnivore, it really, it really depends on, you know, what your definition is. To me, there's only really two good, you know, real working definitions of, of omnivore that make any sort of practical sense to me. Either there are things in both plants and animal, uh, you know, food that, you know, we need to have, like you need, there's something in plants that you need that you can't get from meat. So you have to eat the plants or there's something in meat that you have to have and that you can't get in plants. So you have to have, so you have to have both, or you can get sort of equal nutrition safely from both. We don't fall into either of those two categories. So, you know, we can eat some things and not die, but so can cats and we call them obligate carnivores, right? But you know, there are things in meat that we have to have that we cannot get from plants or fungus, but there is nothing in plants or, or fungi that we have to have that we cannot get from meat. So to me, we are obligate carnivores. We are obligated to eat meat. We cannot survive without meat. We actually thrive in the absence of any plant material. So that, that's what I would argue is that, is that, Yes, we can survive, and yes, that may have given some um, you know advantages at certain times, but it's not optimal. If we're just talking about optimal health, optimal nutrition, then I, I think it's very clear uh, that that's a, car a purely carnivorous one because you know, plants defend themselves by by being poisonous. That's that's botany one hundred and one. You know, I, I learned in I think probably seventh grade that plants and animals are an evolutionary arms race. Plants becoming more and more poisonous, so less and less animals can eat them, so they can survive and thrive. And then animals becoming more adapted to specific poisons in specific plants, so that they can eat that plant safely and break down the toxins into you know safe byproducts safely, so they can survive and thrive. And they, they now that's their dedicated food source. You know they don't have to compete for resources like a koala and eucalyptus. You know nothing else eats eucalyptus. Maybe some bugs do, but koalas don't eat any other plants either. Right. So they're, they're beholden to that. And, um, you know, there are fruit trees that have co-evolved with a cassowary bird that only the cassowary bird can eat these fruits. It will kill basically anything else. And that's because these seeds germinate in the gut of a cassowary bird. And so the tree wants that bird to, to eat it because if, if the bird leaves the area, those seeds will not germinate and those seeds, trees will die out. And so, you know, it, it, it wants to be very, very clear that it's like nothing else should eat this. So, you know, when we talk about nutrition, I think it's important to define our terms and, and define what we're talking about. I'm talking about optimal nutrition, the best that you can possibly do for yourself. And I think it's very clear that that's a, carn a carnivorous diet because biologically we are carnivores and plants are harmful and we don't have uh, pure defenses against them. We have moderate defenses against some things, some people more than others. And then some people will say, well, you know, 
people are different. Everyone's different. And, you know, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, someone should be a vegan. Another person should be a carnivore. Some people be an omnivore and they're just, they're just different. You know, um, I don't think that's possible. That's, that's, you know, you know, biologically impossible because we are the same species, homo sapiens sapiens. I, I've, I've challenged people who've made that claim time and time again to find me an example in nature of two members of the same species that have different optimal diets. And I, I have yet to have someone find an example of that. I don't think it exists. I don't think it definitionally can exist because if you have, you know, two animals that have, have, have different, you know, plant-based or meat-based optimal diets, you're talking about a divergence that's so large. You're, you're talking about two, two different species. Now these, are, these have split off completely and entirely. So no, I think that that we are obligate carnivores in the sense that what our optimal diet is 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 pure high fat meat in the in the complete absence of of any plants or or fungi. Yeah, well, that's interesting. It's it's more extreme you yeah. know <laughs> approach than most, but maybe mm-hmm. you should go back into your history a little more before we dive back into more on that. Is I've under, I understand you've been doing this for a while. And maybe you can include when you kind of learned about plant anti-nutrients beyond yeah. seventh grade, because that's yeah. funny that like we all learned this in seventh grade. And then again, it hurts people's feelings. It, it goes against the, you know, big pharma, big food agendas. So we just kind of disregard it, <laughs> even yeah. though it's like really basic stuff. It is. Yeah, it is basic stuff. You know, I mean, it was, it was just very straightforward that, you know, humans were apex predators and top of the food chain. I mean, that, that was, that was a... That was one of the earlier things that I learned in, in human biology, I, you know, as a, as a grade schooler. Um, mm-hmm. And then, you know, and then, yeah, and then, you know, learning about plant toxins and plants becoming more poisonous and animals adapting to them. And then we go home and we're told that, you know, spinach is the best thing for us and we need roughage mm-hmm. and we need to eat fruits and veg and all these sorts of things and just completely disconnected from what we just learned in biology class. And, you know, the teachers as well, the teacher would probably teach this to people and then go home and force vegetables down their, their kids' throats. And, uh, and you have to force it too, which, which should tell you something. Why would we have evolved to hate the taste of our optimal nutrition or something that's, that's very good for us? That doesn't really make sense. You know, nature is natural. It just happens on its own. And so, you know, if we were out in the wild and you're just eating things and you're trying to survive or whatever, and, and you don't have books and, and, uh, you know, teachers and people telling you like, oh, this is how you have to do it. If you're just trying to figure this out and you're eating something, oh, well, I'm not going to eat that nonsense. You're going to eat what tastes good. You know, sugar is a bit of an outlier, but sugar is a drug. So it's, uh, you know, it causes an addiction. It's trying to get you to eat its plant and, and, and move its seed around. So that benefits the plant. It doesn't necessarily benefit you more than a safe, quick hit of energy to survive and, and get what you need. So then you can go get your optimal diet, but long-term sugar is very, very harmful. Um, so how I, I first really came to this, where I actually had the realization that we should not be eating this stuff, uh, was about 22 years ago when I was taking cancer biology at the university of Washington in Seattle. And we again, sort of went over the fact that you know, plants are, are, um, you know, uh, in the business of staying alive and as living organisms, they have defenses against predation. And while they can't run away or fight back, they do have defenses, but they're just of a different nature. And, and one of the main ones is by making defense chemicals that, you know, poisons and toxins that will harm you if you eat them and, uh, or, or disturb them. They'll, they'll poison you, touch them. They'll, they'll give you a rash or they'll, you know, get in your lungs or all sorts of things. They're, they're toxic to your eyes, all sorts of different things that they do. We were taking cancer biology though. So we were looking at this from a cancer perspective. And so we were looking at carcinogens and we learned 22 years ago that there were 136 identified human carcinogens already identified just in Brussels sprouts. And over 100 carcinogens in white mushrooms and that given literally given lists of all the different you know vegetables and plants uh and the numbers of tox of of uh carcinogens so it was like you know spinach kale lettuce celery cabbage cucumber broccoli you name it not a single one had less than 60 known human carcinogens in them and so we were we were quite blown away by this um 
there's and they were quite abundant as well. We've known since uh, 1989 when uh, Professor Bruce Ames from Berkeley uh, published uh, work, basically you know, when that when different different uh, um, you know interest groups tried to ban pesticides. They're like, oh, these pesticides are poisons. They're harming people. We need to get rid of them. And you know, people were sort of pointing out, like, you know, we've been using pesticides for eighty years. Like, you know, how how are they causing a harm now? And so, Professor Ames did the studies and he looked at it and he found that uh, he didn't actually discover all the poisons and carcinogens that you know I learned about, you know, you know, a decade or more later. But just at the time. They discovered 42 different toxins, 20 of which were so shown to be carcinogenic in animal models. And he found that of those 42 toxins, that the natural toxins and carcinogens, uh, basically natural pesticides and insecticides, is what the plant uses to stop animals and insects from eating them, that they outweighed the pesticides that we sprayed on these plants industrially by a factor of 10,000. And that they were orders of magnitude more likely to cause cancer than the industrial pesticides we spray on them. So this is why we still have pesticides, you know, and because because they found that, well, actually the plants were. So how, how bad can it be? You know, if people are willing to eat the salad, you know, the pesticides are probably not gonna not gonna do much to them. And so, you know, we we were blown away by this. When, when we're learning this in class and literally everyone's looking around, thrashing our heads around, looking for like the TA, like snickering in the corner, like, ah, he's just joking, you know, but, but there wasn't anyone, you know, and we, and we just, it just sort of dawned on us that they're like, okay, this guy's serious. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, because of decades of, of, uh, of indoctrination, you know, but, but vegetables are still good for you though. Right. And he just looked at us and he just said, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. So I was like, right, screw plants. And I'm just, <laughs> just like, you know, went to the store. I, I just threw out any, any, I didn't have much plants anyway. I didn't really care for them, but I, I just, I just went to the store and I was just like, okay, what, what can I get that doesn't have plants? And so I inadvertently went on a carnivore diet. I'm just like meat and eggs simply because I, I just would not eat anything that had a plant in it. And I realized that everything had plants in it. Everything, you know, had grains or bread or produce or or you know, packaged, ready-made meals, all these things. Everything had had uh, uh, plants and vegetables and fruits and, and fungus and everything like that in it. So I was just, I just came across eggs. I was like, okay, I guess eggs. I can eat eggs. Eggs don't come from a plant. I guess meat, meat doesn't come from a plant. You know, and I didn't put two and two together that like, oh, actually, you know, humans are carnivores, apex predators. Huh, maybe, maybe we should only be eating meat. I figured it out for my dog, you know, I, I was feeding her you know, kibble one day and I said, you know, dogs are wolves. Wolves eat meat. Shouldn't we just be giving her meat? But again, you know, the years of indoctrination, you know, from the food companies and elsewhere said, well, you know, this is dog food and these are the dog companies. They know what a dog is supposed to eat. So I guess this is supposed this, this should be what's healthiest for them. Stupid, stupid move because of course they don't give a crap, you know, about the health of the dog. They just want to keep dogs healthy enough so that they don't die and can keep buying dog food. Right. But they want to put in cheap filler crap that, that uh, has a big profit margin. And unfortunately, um, that, that, you know, costs us years in, in, uh, in the lives of our pets. You know, before we switched over to uh, packaged dog food, like in the 70s, the average life expectancy in America of a golden retriever was 17 years. Now it's nine years. Okay. So we, we mm. have the life, the life expectancy of, of dogs just by feeding them garbage. And we also know that we've done this to humans because we know genetically that we're supposed to live on average 120 years on average, right? So that means Wait, that yeah. right now that's like kind of our peak. Yeah. So you, you think that that's our average? Genetically it is. Yeah. You know, I, I learned that in genetics class 20 years ago, you know, what evidence is there for that? This telomeres. Yeah. You look, you look at telomeres and you look at the, uh, you know, the, the life cycle of a cell and you look at how many times that they can, uh, that they can uh, replicate and change and split and you can sort of track the telomeres. And so based on that and based on, you know, different genetic information, 
uh, they, they've been able to sort of estimate that. And that's why for a few decades now, they're like, oh, you know, the first 120, you know, person to live 120 years has already been born and all this sort of stuff. You know, what that means is if you just stay out of your own way and don't mess up, you should make it to 120 years without doing anything special. You know, and yet we're dying in our 60s and 70s, you know, and we're calling that average. We're calling that, you know, ripe old age. You know, I, I, I sit in on, on uh, multidisciplinary meetings where we talk about someone who has cancer, someone who has this or that, and they talk about like, oh, well, should we do operate on this person? Oh, they're 75. Like, ah, well, you know, they've had a good life. It's like, you know, no, they've got like, they should have 50 years in front of them, you know, Did, but we consider of, that the end of life. Sorry. Have you heard of Dr. Michael Rose? He's a no, no, he's the aging specialist. He's done a lot of the great research on fruit flies that talk about aging. He mm. talks about, he wrote the book, Does Aging Stop? I think it's called. I interviewed him. He's he's basically almost on the same page on a lot of this stuff. He looks 20 years younger uh, than he, he is. And he basically, I think, I don't want to quote misquote him, but I mean, I think he thinks we could live to 160. Mm. And that... If we, yeah, if we don't live with our modern diet and lifestyle, basically he coined that idea. People think that when you get to 30, your metabolism slows down. He says it's actually the opposite. It's when you get to 30, you're less adapted to the modern trash. <laughs> you're less, nice. you're basically, and he found that with fruit flies and all his research. But basically he's saying that if you're eating the human species appropriate diet, that aging kind of, like you just said, if you get out of your own way, you can mm. aging kind of does stop at a certain point and you can kind of just coast and, and keep living. And that, yeah, I think that our ancestors did live a, a lot longer if they're eating their natural diet. I just, do you know anything about the, the fossil evidence of like, we just don't have, it's so sparse. We just don't happen to have ones or actually it's, we, we have such a skewed view of what a fossil would look like or human remains would look like that we look at someone and we're assigning the wrong age to them. This is how I understand it. So if we dig up some bones and they're like, oh, this person has arthritis, you know, you can see the remnants of this in the bones or they have certain wear and tear in their teeth or something. We, we just assume that this person must be 70 because modern humans have that when they're 70. This person could be 150 mm -hmm. and just have, and that's when they finally got some of this yeah. arthritis. Yeah, well, I, I, absolutely. And the thing is too, is that a lot of times when you're looking at, at uh, um, evidence of, of in the fossil record of of arthritis as well, it's usually after the industrial revolution, or sorry, the agricultural revolution, right? Because quite often, you know, humans like the Maasai and uh, and Native Americans, uh, you know, living naturally previously, uh, and the Inuits uh, and so forth, they don't really get arthritis. But um, you know, there's you know sort of stories and anecdotes of uh, of different Maasai who, um, there was one guy I saw, uh, you know, something, it was like a story about him and he was talking about how his dad basically was a, was a trader. He was a liaison between the, the Maasai tribe and, and the Western cities. And so he would go into town and he would, you know, trade whatever they had to trade, uh, for whatever they wanted to get. And so he would, you know, be meeting with people and they would, uh, you know, they would have like, you know, candies and sweets and, and whatever. And so he'd eat these things sometimes. And then you go back and eat, you know, the, what the Maasai, you know, drinking blood, drinking milk and eating, eating meat. And apparently they, they said that it's like, yeah, you know, when he was in his eighties, he started getting arthritis and he started, you know, you know, not feeling as good. And, you know, that's just something that just doesn't happen to us. You know, so he was breaking down way early in his, like in his eighties, he was already breaking down and getting arthritis. So, you know, yeah, you're right. You know, this is, this is, we're, we're judging this based on, on how decrepit and quickly people break down now, but that's, that's not actually how our, our bodies are designed. Um, you know, you see animals in the zoo when eating a natural diet really don't get arthritis and, and autoimmune issues and all these sorts of things. Um, you know, the telomeres that you know, one of the cool things is, is, uh, like lobsters cap their telomeres or they've already capped their telomeres. So these, these little bastards are immortal. They'll just, they'll just live forever if they don't get killed by something. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's kind of an interesting line. And, you know, this is what cancer cells do. They can, they can cap their telomeres so they can just keep, keep replicating. And, uh, I think that, you know, 
we figure out how to cap our telomeres. We make it pass way past 160, you know, but, you know, we'll probably screw something up and get some weird ass cancer uh, or something like that. Well, um, we'll, pro- well, people will be eating the wrong food and living the wrong lifestyle so that something yeah. else will get us. But yeah. I got to tell my stories about Maasai and Hadza and all this stuff. Mm. Uh, there, yeah, I mean, I was there. I was drinking the blood and milk with them. And I'm, and I saw the decline. It's pretty amazing how, the, yeah, the closer they are to the city, the worse they are. And then there was Maasai, like native Maasai that lived in the city that look like Americans from mm. Kentucky that eat McDonald's. Yeah. Like they looked bad. <laughs> and then you go out and then you, you know, the farther you get away from the city, the better they look, the taller, the stronger they are, the better teeth they have. Another thing was interesting uh, we visited a group of elders. We got like 50 elders together. We organized, I went with Mary Ruddick. She's a great nutrition person. Oh, nice. Organized organize yeah. this trip. And we got 50 of them. It was an agricultural community. So they were living off of just cheap grains and mm. like fruits that they could grow or whatever. Just mainly grains, actually. It was just like Ugali, like cornmeal and water. And they just had not much. And this was a group of people that looked like a nursing home in the U.S., Right mm-hmm. out in the out in the boonies where they're just eating meat, they're eating their natural diet, jumping around. Lady was 105 years old, jumping around, doing great. Yeah. In this agricultural community, 50 the, the oldest group. We got all of them together. There's 50 of them. They were bent over. They had arthritis. They had all these things, and they were bragging about how healthy their diet was because they only eat plants. Because this yeah. propaganda has made it out to them, and they That's were so terrible. proud. They were cheering about Ugali. They were, it, it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really bad. And it, it's really unfortunate that they were, you know, suckered into that and, and, and thinking that they were actually healthy when, when the evidence is right in front of their face that, that of course they aren't. And, you know, they can look at other people that are literally twice their age and, and, uh, twice their health as well. Um, you know, the Native Americans, uh, you know, well documented to be living well over a hundred, you know, as stone age nomads. You know, with a, not 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 like you know in a nursing home, turning to dust for forty years, bent and decrepit, but you know, with a pack on their back, following the buffalo herds day in and day out. Uh, Dr. Salisbury in the eighteen hundreds, you know, he lived with the the Native Americans, and he he documented, you know, you know very clearly. You know, he had these people that were one hundred and ten. Uh, wife was one hundred and ten. The husband was one hundred and fifteen. He was very spry. He's running around. She was actually unwell, and she was sort of, um, you know, he was very very anxious about that. So he's just running around trying to get things for her and all these sorts of things. 115, you know? And and this is this is not uncommon uh in these these um uh natural uh civilizations living naturally. Um the problem is that people just dismiss them, you know. They just say, "Oh, well, you know, they they just put you know great store in uh, in, in people living a long time." And so, you know, they they're just saying that. So it's like, "Well, first of all, you don't know that." And second of all, you know, why is it that every single time in every single population on every single continent, they're all saying the same damn thing, you know, that these guys is like, yeah, you know, I've, I've lived, you know, I, I was born when that volcano erupted and they're like, Jesus Christ, that was 120 years ago, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, like, they must be lying. But, you know, we have, we have other sort of documentation, um, such as like, I mean, j- just going back in history, literally the father of history, Herodotus. Um, you know, there's a, there's a chronicle of, um, of a meeting between, uh, the, the king of Persia or, or sorry, the emissary from Persia and the king of Ethiopia way back in the day. And, uh, like Persian empire, they, they took over, uh, you know, Egypt and they were like talking to their new neighbors. And so the king of Ethiopia sort of asked them, the, the guy from Persia said, okay, you know, what do you guys eat and how long do you guys normally live? And the guy from Persia, you know, you know, told him about growing wheat and making bread and said, yeah, well, we, you know, we'd normally live 70 years. This is 3000 years ago. Right. And, um, and, uh, the King from Ethiopia just sort of laughed at him and said, well, no, no wonder you live such short lives. If all you eat is dirt, you know, like I people like all we eat is boiled meat and we only drink the milk of our cattle, uh, of, of our livestock. And we would live 120 years and sometimes more than that. You know, he may have been bragging, you know, he may have been lying, but he picked the exact age that we now know we should be living to naturally, uh, genetically. 
you know, it even says in the Bible, you know, people will live 120 years, you know, I mean, not, not that that's like a, you know, scientific record, but it's interesting. It is interesting that that age range keeps popping up and that people, you know, that the longest lived uh, Native American, I think it was a chief white, I think it's chief white wolf. And he was said to have been born in the late 1700s and died in the early 1900s. So he was uh, said to be 137 years old, you know? And, um, you know, and, the, and there are other examples of this and it, you know, it keeps coming back to that range right around 120 years that we now know we should be living to if we were living naturally, if we were giving our body what it needed to thrive and, and not poisoning it with a bunch of plant toxins and, and, and harming it. You know, I mean, we, everyone knows that you smoke and you drink and you do drugs, you're, you're going to degrade and age a lot faster than you would otherwise and die a lot younger. Okay. Well, the same is true of other poisons and toxins that we take in, including that from spinach. And so, you know, while spinach isn't going to kill you as fast as smoking, you know, or just, you know, kill you dead, like, you know, hemlock or something like that, or the majority of plants on this earth, which are inedible, will kill you right away. You know, it's still going to not be optimal, not give you the nutrition you need, and it will slow you down and hamper you with, with various toxins that will harm you. So, you know, slow poison is still poison. And if you're, if you're dying 30, 40, 50 years early, I would consider that uh, you know, a significant poison, you know? Yeah. Well, you kind of just answered my original question of, you know, we can eat plants, but maybe this is why, yeah, this is why we're dying. young. we have all these ideas of why we're dying younger and younger with more and more diseases. And I mean, if you, I'm not saying, I'm not ready to say we're hundred percent carnivore, but if we're, the, the plants are taking us down are like our first, you know, thing that's harming us. And then if you go into processed foods and refined mm -hmm. grains and seed oils, then you could lower that down to like 50, 60 is what we're seeing. But it's just interesting that people around the world are, are getting, well, since agriculture, we got smaller, we got uh, yeah, yeah. more disease. We have all these records. Our brains got smaller. We, we just less robust. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you, you talk about like, you know, we can't, you know, we can eat plants. It's like, yeah, well, we can do cocaine. You know, that doesn't mean it's good for us, you know, just, be, just because we can get away with it, you know, it doesn't mean that that's optimal. And, and, and again, I think it's, I think it's a definitional thing because, because, you know, we, we, we can define ourselves as omnivores because we can survive more readily on plant material than, than other, uh, you know, carnivores such as, you know, uh, canines and felines. And I'm, I'm fine with that. But I think if we're talking about optimal nutrition, I, I would I would consider that a carnivore diet. I would consider that you know since we've been living as you know pure carnivores, apex predators for so long, we have simply lost the majority of our defenses and abilities to break these these uh, you know plant toxins down safely, and so they they will cause harm. Some things will cause very little harm, but it's still a negative, right? It's still bringing you down a notch. And so, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about what's optimal, I would still argue that, that that's, that's purely from animal source nutrition. So here's a curveball that I didn't prepare you for. Yeah. Uh, there's a study about 105 countries study of men and the correlates to height. And there's mm -hmm. a newer version of that study that talks about all the different foods that all these different countries, you know, very much epidemiology, but very mm -hmm. interesting that what proteins and what foods correlated to the height. And what mm -hmm. they found is that it was very linear, that the more animal foods they ate, the taller they were. Mm -hmm. And you can see it, even they do maps of around the globe where you can see that people are shorter around the equator and they eat less animal foods there. And the tallest people in the world's currently are the, you know, sort of Norwegian, like Viking type people. They're the farthest away, right? They're the most North where the most and the most animal foods naturally are. And also they eat the most animal protein. So it's super interesting. And I, I've always tried to get guests to talk about why they think we've developed differently as humans. We're talking about the genetic stuff before and how we are all the same species, yet people around the equator are much shorter. Mm -hmm. And 
You know what I mean? Like there is this correlation. I don't think people like talking about it because I don't know, it's not PC to to like talk about people's height and different. I don't, I don't know what, why people don't talk about it. But yeah. do you kind of know where I'm going with this? Is like there, there's different. We're all the same species, yet we became different heights on average, right? This is very much like on average as a as a mm. big population average. We became different heights, and I'm thinking there's something to do with the diet that we've eaten for thousands of generations. So if you have thousands of generations of people subsisting on rice and plants and a little bit of fish, people are saying, "Oh man, the Okinawans are so." Health, they live so long. Well, yeah, they subsist. Well, also they do eat pork and they do eat fish. You know, they're definitely eating animal foods. Yeah. But, uh, you know, yes. Yeah, so there, there's entire, this is like a whole experiment over the past couple hundred thousand years or even, yeah, we'll, we'll call it 300,000 years experiment yeah. of, okay, so what happens if entire ra- pe- groups of people that turn into races eat different diets? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, you know, and a lot of this I think has to do with development as opposed to genetics, you know, um, you know, we, we look back at the fossil record, like you said, you know, pre agriculture, humans were just taller, they were taller, bigger, broader, big jaws, straight teeth and, and and bigger brains, you know, on average 11% larger before the agricultural revolution for an adult male. And, you know, we had the, these fossil records around these people that were, you know, mammoth hunters and had an abundance of nutrition. And, you know, the, some of these places were, were on average six foot two, six foot three on average, right? So average height in America of an adult male is, is five foot eight, you know, like that's, that's, you know, a lot shorter. That's a big, big difference. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these people are literally, you know, prehistoric, you know, but the average height of a population uh, generally tells you the average health of a population and you'll see, uh, and you, you certainly can have, you know, just, you know, generation after generation after generation eating a crappy diet and maybe, you know, height not being as important. And so there can be some selection factors there, but at the same time you get, you know, sumo wrestlers in Japan who are monsters, right? Mm-hmm. And then you get, you know, the, the wizened little Chinese couple, that escapes, you know, Mao Zedong and gets over to America and they're, you know, they've been, you know, starved in famines and all these things. And so their, their growth has been stunted and they're, you know, five foot tall. And then they have a son who's six, three, six, four, you know, I, I played rugby with a guy who, who was that, you know, his, his parents were tiny, they were these, these tiny little things. And he was just this monster, you know, he was bigger than me. He was, he was a little taller than me and he was broader than me. And, and his, and his parents were absolutely tiny. So I think a lot of it has to do with, with, uh, development, you know, our brains being smaller. I don't think that's genetic. I think, you know, because our, our brains were getting larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. And that's something uh, I showed a graphic of this in my talk at KetoCon, um, that it was, you know, our brains are getting larger and larger and larger. And then all of a sudden there's this spike down right at, right when agriculture hits and our pink goes straight down, you know, that, that doesn't track. So, you know, I think that that's, um, that's to do with, with nutrition and development. We're not developing properly. You know, we're not feeding our kids a carnivore diet. You know, women aren't on a carnivore diet when they're gestating or breastfeeding. And so kids just aren't developing to their genetic potential. And, and, you know, there are carnivore kids that are eating, uh, just carnivore and their parents, uh, or mothers were, were carnivore during gestation and they're developing faster. Their brains are bigger you know, they're, they're, they're hitting their milestones physically and mentally much faster. And so I think that's a, that's a testament to just eating the right thing. You know, you mentioned Okinawa, you know, that, that gets famously spoken about in the blue zone study, you know, the blue zone, uh, said that, oh, well, this was a blue zone. And so they live longer. And then they, they jump to the conclusion that this is because they were mostly plant-based, which is, which is, which is a false conclusion because in Okinawa, they actually eat more meat than the average Japanese person does. They just eat it in the form of like pork and fish and things like that. They say, oh, they eat these yams and blah, 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 blah. Nonsense. They eat more meat than the average Japanese person does. And they're living cleaner lives, most likely. They're probably, you know, not smoking and drinking as much and having other sorts of uh, benefits of, uh, of, of avoiding that sort of nonsense. Um, and the other, other sort of blue zones were equally as, uh, as problematic. But, um, you know, 
there was also a study that just came out um, a couple months ago. We looked at 175 different uh, different countries, and they corrected for a lot of different confounding factors, such as you know wealth and and poverty, and uh, and things like that. And they found that the in every single country there wasn't there wasn't a single one that deviated. All 175 countries that the people who ate more meat were healthier, lived longer. Every single country they found this, you know, and, and people talk about the blue zones, uh, which is just cherry picked and, you know, fictitious, right? Because we, we you know, they, they came to a conclusion that was not borne out by their own data. You know, mm-hmm. they're saying, oh, because these are plant-based, therefore they live longer. Well, no, but these guys actually ate more meat than the people around them. Mm-hmm. So no, that's, that's obviously not what it was. And, and they, they didn't exactly look at uh, Hong Kong and use that as a blue zone. Um, because Hong Kong has the, um, the highest life expectancy from birth in the world. And they also have the highest meat consumption per capita in the world. So you can't, you can't, uh, honestly, you know, dismiss that and and leave that out of your, of your study if you're trying to do, uh, honest work and honest research. So they're clearly not, it's clearly agenda driven, uh, biased study. That unfortunately mm-hmm. has uh, you know has 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 uh, influenced a lot of people. Well, if you're talking about blues, I don't know if it's ever even a study. <laughs> it's it's yeah, kind no. of just folklore in a book. And yeah. yeah, and Mary Reddick, who I mentioned, is going to those places like Ikaria um, in Greece, and she's, she's like talking to them, interviewing them. You know, she's on this mission to kind of a little bit of retracing the steps of what Weston price and debunking the blue zones. And they're just, yeah. they eat goat, they eat, or they eat everything. They're, they're just constantly eating animal foods. They use real animal fat to cook with. She said they were like highly, highly uh, meat based. So it's yeah. just interesting. People see what they want to see, man. There's so many tangents we could go down. Cause I want to know why you think there is this agenda. Like how does this agenda work? Because it's so obvious that mm. we have this every, like, even I sent you this study, like, an hour before we recorded about Tufts. They just, you know, they're trying to do these correlations with meat and disease, right? It's like these plant-based, usually it's these institutions like Harvard and Tufts that are funded by all the big food stuff, but they're always trying to just, it's a selective bias. It's the cherry picking too of like, oh, you know, the guy, Dan Buettner goes around and looks at the blue zones and he sees what he wants to see type of thing. It's the same thing. It's like, there's these big studies being commissioned by, you know, who knows who to kind of look for why can we blame stuff on meat? Yeah. So yeah. What, 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 yeah. What, where did this start? What is it? I mean, I know this is a big question and I just, it's what we're facing though. It's like, it's so obvious that they're trying, they're reaching. Yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it could it could have a lot of, of different uh, you know um, intentions behind it and um, but you know I mean quite quite simply uh, you know there, there are a lot of financial interests involved and you know probably the easiest way to to prove definitively is the vilification of meat via cholesterol um, you know they they needed a scapegoat. The sugar industries needed a scapegoat in, in uh, heart disease because there was, there was evidence and studies coming out showing a strong correlation between uh, increased sugar consumption and refined sugar in nations and increase in heart disease in these nations. And so they put out, you know, counter industrial, uh, um, you know, studies and, and reports to counter this, you know, th- this information that was coming out, uh, but they didn't report it as, in, you know, industrial, you know, industry research. They actually, you know, uh, put it forward as if it was completely independent. Um, but we know that that's not true. The Journal of the American Medical Association published in 2015 actual uh, internal memos from the sugar companies back in like, you know, the, the 60s or so detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol was causing heart disease when it was really sugar and to exonerate sugar. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA. And then he was the one who authored and published the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol caused heart disease and saturated fat increased cholesterol. So he said, stop eating both. And the world listened and, you know, to its detriment. So, 
in America, we reduced our, our, our cholesterol consumption by cholesterol and saturated fat by 30%, reduced red meat by 33% or so, increased fruits and vegetables by 30 and 40% respectively, you know, increased, you know, grains and sugar as well. And what happened? Well, first of all, the, the heart disease rate tripled, right? So you can't say that cholesterol causes heart disease when you reduce cholesterol and heart disease increases, triples, you know? So, you know, if anything, you can say that it's protective. And in fact, that that's what the studies are showing now that after 2015, there's been a bunch of big studies with hundreds of thousands of patients showing a protective nature of LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol. And so people that are having higher LDL cholesterol are actually having less heart attack, less strokes, more saturated fat, less heart attack, less strokes. Uh, patients that are over the age of 60, who have higher LDL cholesterol are living longer, are staying out of nursing homes, are protected against Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So cholesterol is really, really good for you. And we've actually known this for a very long time and, and argued that. So, so a lot of scientists and doctors arguing in the 50s, 60s, and 70s saying, no, 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 fat is really good for us. You know, these are, these are really, really healthy stuff. And, but it just got completely papered over by that. So that, that's, that's a very, very, you know, uh, well-documented, uh, you know, piece of sort of, you know, industry misinformation there to protect a, 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 an invested interest. You know, there was also the seventh day Adventists who pushed a vegan diet in the 1800s because they knew that this suppressed, you know, lustful feelings. And of course, lust is, a, is one of the seven deadly sins. So obviously that's a good thing to suppress that. So it's good to be vegan because you're going to suppress this horrible, bad feeling. And so they were pushing this is where, you know, Kellogg's uh, cereal comes from. Dr. Kellogg's was a uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventist and a big proponent of this. He was also the guy who convinced uh, America that it was uh, in, in a child's best interest medically to circumcise young boys. This was not in, in any medical interest. This was to make it more difficult to masturbate and fornicate because if you don't have the play of a foreskin, you know, you, it's, it's more difficult. So that's, um, that, that was an agenda as well. A pretty, pretty weird one. You know, I don't know why this guy was up at night, you know, worrying about, you know, what other people were doing, but apparently he was. And so, um, that those are two examples of that. But I think that there's also, you know, probably something to be said for the fact that there have been, you know, uh, examples of, of different nations oppressing populations, limiting the amount of meat that they had availability to in order to keep them weak and easily suppressible. I think that that is uh, a potential thing. I don't have any proof of that, but that is a concern of mine because there's such a hard press to vilify meat, to vilify any animal-based protein and to destroy the cattle industry in America and around the world. Around the world, they're trying to destroy uh, the cattle industry and, and just slaughter all the livestock and, and really, really, really stop anyone from eating animal based and, uh, you know, pushing all this fake meat slop chemical garbage and, and trying to convince us that this is a good thing. You know, I think that there are, um, you know, uh, so many, uh, pieces of evidence now coming available to people that they can see more and more and more, the veracity of, uh, of the benefits of, a, of an animal-based diet, even if you still eat plants, you know, eating more meat is, is going to help your health, period. And there's just a ton of evidence to support that. And yet now that there is more evidence than ever, people are pushing harder than ever to shut that down. And so to me, that, that makes me concerned that there's, you know, there, there's some sort of weird agenda that goes beyond just the bottom line. Yeah, I think it's more than money. Money's the easy mm. answer. It's mm. always about money and it can explain a lot of it. And it's it's a lot of, yeah, why the cholesterol stuff was done is all these big food companies it made trillions from that. This is kind of going into my presentation of, you know, the agenda. I, I kind of just pinned it on money just so I wouldn't sound like a conspiracy theorist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's it's so hard to not sound. It sounds far fetched, but there are examples of mm. countries limiting, like you said. Yeah. What what are those examples? I know there's some. Um, you, yeah. you know what I mean. <clears throat> so England, England, you know, notoriously did it. Um, it was done in Ireland as well by the English to the Irish. 
um, you know, the different famines around, you know, the, the, um, uh, you know, in, in the communist nations as well. I mean, they were just starved of everything really, but, you know, but they, they really didn't have access to me. That was, that, that was very, very difficult to get. And so, you know, you, you'd see, you know, serious, you know, health ramifications from that. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, English weren't allowed to hunt. Those were the king's deer and the king's this, that, and the other. And, and you know, they, they limited the amount of meat. So they would, you know, catch rabbits and things like that. And then, you know, if, uh, and that was sort of basically the only animal nutrition they were able to get and allowed to get. And, uh, and, you know, and, and at different times there would be like a, a plague that would sort of wipe out the rabbit population and, and people would just starved on mass. And, um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, and, 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 you know, I mean, this, this, this sort of gets um, into other sort of weird, weird territory as well, but there, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Like everything has been done. You know, we're talking about, you know, people being PC. Oh, you're not allowed to say that. You can't say that. Uh, and, you know, why not? It's like, well, that means this now. It's like, that has never meant that ever in the entire history of the English language. You know, that's not what that word means. It's like, well, no, that's what that word means now because I said so. Uh, that's insane. But that's, but that's not, that's not you know, unheard of because that, you know, Thucydides actually chronicled, uh, a, um, Thucydides was a, like a, an Athenian general and a historian in ancient Greece, um, sort of around the, the time of the Peloponnesian Wars and he wrote, you know, books on the Peloponnesian Wars, but he chronicled a, um, uh, a civil war between one of the, the Greek city states. And he was marveling at the fact that they were changing the definitions of words for political expediency. They're like, they're, they're changing the definition of words. They're trying to you know, push this, that, and the other, and they're just changing what words mean in order to push that, you know, so that, that, that goes back, what, 2,600 years, you know, so that, that's not a new thing, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, different, you know, regimes that have tried to take over and, and use, you know, political influence to do that have, have done that certainly within the, in the 20th century. That was a very common tactic in, in various, uh, in various, um, you know, hostile takeovers of nations, but <clears throat> also uh, in ancient Greece, there there was an example of a king. I forget exactly which which sort of uh, city state he took over, but this guy took over this area, took over this this uh, little city state in in Greece, and he passed a law, decreed that you know killed all the men, killed all the you know the fighting age uh, young men as well, and decreed that all young boys growing up had to be raised as girls. They had to be put in dresses. They had to be doing, you know, chores that women would do and raised as women. And he was very clear that this was in order to emasculate men and make it harder for them, less likely for them to grow into angry, bitter, you know, men that wanted to fight him and take back, you know, their, their, uh, country and their city, uh, from oppression. And so he, did this in order to, you know, keep them under control more. And, and that's the thing, you know, we, we have example after example, after example, basically, you know, uh, there, there are very, very few exceptions to this rule that people in power want to have more power. They want to control, they want to dominate that, that, that governments, the nature of government is to grow and for Liberty yield. Right. That's what Thomas Jefferson said. So that is the nature of these things. And so we have, we have a few little bright spots like ancient Athens, you know, ancient Rome, you know, and, and, you know, America and a, and a few other, you know, uh, democratic republics, you know, since then, but these have been bright spots in a very dark history of, of oppression and tyranny. And we, we've just gotten really used to just having it so good that we forgot that that existed. And if you just, you know, study history, like you, you just see this far away, you know, I mean, like, um, uh, uh, Friedrich, um, Hayek wrote the book, uh, road to serfdom. And he just, he just detailed out. It's just like, look, you can, you can see the different countries going down a socialist communist sort of route. And you can see them 20 years in advance because they do these very specific things. And these little things drop off and drop off and drop off. And it makes them ripe for this sort of uh, political takeover. And, you know, and you can read this and it, and it, and it happens in all these different countries. And, and now we have people saying that, well, actually, you know, 
you know, communism got a bad rap and, and socialism is actually a good idea. I know doctors here in Australia who argue that, who say that, oh yeah, I know socialism is a great idea. And I was like, okay, well, why not just communism then? Well, yeah, maybe we should. Well, I think we should have communism. It's not it's been done like, correctly yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, you know, if, if you don't understand the, the, you know, the absolute horrors and mass murders of the communist regimes of the 20th century, you know, that that's a level of ignorance that borders on the miraculous. Like, how the hell do you not know about that? And I, I asked the guy, I was like, so 200 million dead people, 200 million people dead, that's not enough for you? You want more than that? And he was like, what, what, what do you mean? He's genuinely baffled. He had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, you know, two, you know, over 200 million people have died under communist regimes just in the last century. You, you really want to keep keep pushing that. And you know more are still dying under you know China. I mean, this is this is a very poorly kept mm-hmm. secret that you know uh, mm-hmm, China yeah. still has slave camps. They still have uh, gulags. They still you know they're still committing mass genocide and 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 enslaving you know the Uyghur Muslims and things like that. This, this is not hidden. You know they 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 harvest the organs of their political prisoners to give uh, organ transplants. Do you know that that was that was published news. You know, just like like last year, the year before, and yet, and yet, we don't have any any um, sanctions or problems, you know, trading with them. That's insane to me. Um, so he didn't know any of this crap, and uh, and the, his response to that was, well, you know, but but people die under you know you know uh, you know capitalist countries too. And I was like, no, man, like not die like of old age, you dumbass. I mean, like murdered through internal oppression. You know, and 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 forced famines and things like that, and he had no oh, idea. Guys, how to it. In, um, of people making their own decisions based on bad guidelines and food. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. Yeah, and like, and uh, yeah, sort of, a, sort of a, a forced famine of of that kind as well, just because you know you're just brainwashed. But uh, but yeah, and and you know, I said like you know, you know, Stalin killed, you know, probably sixty seven million of his own people, and he was like. Who's Stalin? I was like, what Whoa. do you mean who's Stalin? He was the leader of the USSR. He's like, what's the USSR? I'm like, dude, this was not that long ago. You know, yeah. you're you're a grown ass man and you're a doctor and you're and you're you know, you and as a doctor, you are supposed to be educated, but of course, you know, they're not educated in 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 these sorts of things that matter. And, you know, I asked the guy, I was like, okay, well, do you know who Hitler was? And he's just like, yeah, well, duh, of course I know who Hitler was. And I was like, okay, well, duh, you should know who Stalin was because he was his contemporary, he was his ally, he was, and then he fought against him, and then he killed 10 times the amount of people that Hitler did. So why don't you know who that is? And so it's crazy. I, I think that, um, you know, if you read if you read those books and you read history, you sort of you see the sort of the things coming around. Before it used to be that oh no 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 that's not what we want. Now they're openly saying this. This is a political move. They're saying yeah no socialism is a great idea. You know, however you feel about Bernie Sanders, he he was in the Socialist Party as a politician for a number of years, and he espouses those socialist principles. And he made a very good run in the in uh, for the presidency, and. Um, I think that that's very telling. I think that that we have we have shifted and moved in such a direction that that that's, that's, that's even possible uh, to do that. And so I think that you know there have definitely been a lot of moves in you know uh, the last couple of decades to get us where we are now. And I, and I think that keeping people you know weak and controllable is uh, a very important part of that because people don't give up their freedom. Free people don't give up their freedoms. Uh, very willingly. Oh, well, that's why we have this big crew in Texas here uh, mm-hmm. of people that they're eating meat. They believe in freedom. They are fighting for it. And they're students of history too. Everyone yeah. I know understands history, understands what's going on. And yeah, they're, man, I don't know if people, people out there are either nodding their heads feverishly, agreeing with us. And there may be one person out there who doesn't get it. Maybe they need to wake up that this stuff's going on. And that yeah. I always relate it to like a, a preschool. It's like, there's the principal, there's the teachers and there's the rugrats running around. I mean, it's just their job to just control them and keep them in line and whatever, pacify them. And I feel like that's kind of what's going on. 
Yeah. Well, and, but it, and it's exactly like that. It's that same mentality as well, because you'll, you'll hear people and they'll say, you know, like, I mean, I, th- I think, um, you know, like Penn from Penn and Teller, who's, uh, you know, politically uh, libertarian, you know, wants people to be able to live their own lives. And he said he was arguing on, um, oh gosh, what was it? Oh, oh, he's that guy. He had that talk show for years. It was like an hour long sort of thing, Larry King. And so he was on with Larry King and he was saying, he's just like, you know, I think that people, you know, are, are capable of living their own lives better than someone else living them for them. And whether, you know, and, and when, you know, a decision, when you pay the consequences for it, for an action, you are much more likely to think about that, that action and its consequences rather than someone else who's going to do this for you. You know, people make bad decisions all the time, but hopefully they learn from them and that's how you learn and grow as, as an adult. And, uh, and so he was making that argument. And Larry King just sort of cut him off and just like, you know, we have, we have a nation of 300 million people and someone needs to think for the masses. Well, I, I guarantee you that Larry King does not consider, did not consider himself one of the masses. You know, it's always <laughs> them over there. It's always these idiot plebeians who can't think for themselves. And it's like, I'm sorry, man, you are one of the masses. You are what they talk about when we talk about them. We all are. Okay. That's the whole point. All right. And so, you know, we, we think about things as like, well, yeah, these people, they just, they just can't think that that is such a a hubris and an elitist attitude. And and first of all, it's dead wrong. I mean, they don't realize that they are absolutely going to be some of the first ones, you know, cracked into the gulag and, um, you know, but, but it's, it's, it's ridiculous to, to just assume that someone else is less capable of living their lives than, than you are. Because no one considers themselves one of those people that, that needs their lives lived for them, that needs to have all their decisions made for them and needs to be forced to do all these things that they don't want to do for their own good. You know, most people just think that that's going to happen to other people that, well, obviously I'm this, this enlightened, intelligent, you know, person. So obviously I'm going to be able to live my own life, but it's all these other people that don't, no, 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 it's you, you are going to be the one getting control because we're all going to be controlled because, because communism is slavery by definition. People think, oh, communism is so nice. If people were just nicer, it would all work out. You know, that's, that's like saying if, 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 if slaves were nicer and just, you know, wanted to work, uh, you know, for free, everyone would get along well. You know, that's, that's literally what it is because what you do, what you produce is not your own. That does not belong to you. That goes to the government, to your masters, Right. Okay. That's the definition of slavery. You get enough to live, you get enough to survive and maybe, you know, raise some kids and you'll go on a vacation every now and then. Okay. And, but what you produce is not your own. Okay. That is slavery. And you know, we think of this, they, they think it's like, oh, the government's so nice. It's so sweet. It's so wonderful. And if we had this totalitarian autocracy, you know, then we could, we could help everybody out. But, you know, a government that is strong enough to, to make a utopia is also strong enough to keep you in repression forever. And so what is it? You know, the government is not some entity, certainly not a benevolent one. It's people, people run the government, people are in the government. And so the government owns everything. It owns your work. It owns your life. It owns everything. It owns all your property, everything the government does. People do. Those are your masters. And there's someone at the top. There's someone running the government. So it's automatically a totalitarian dictatorship slave state. On, on its face, that's what it is. And so, you know, morally and ethically, I don't think that you can argue that that's a good way of doing things. And objectively, it doesn't work. You know, that's why there's a place called America and there's not a place called the USSR anymore, you know, because their system did not keep it together. And so they went, yeah, screw this. We're not doing it anymore. You know, we're going to, we're going to, to open up the markets and things like that because that, that, that system works better. And so, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's oh, a bit great. weird, uh, you know, that they're, you know, but doing that, but that, that's what it is anyway. It's, um, it has that mentality of this school teacher and it's just like, we know better, you need to be controlled. And I, I just think that's entirely wrong. I think people are more than capable of living their own lives and, and making uh, decisions uh, for which to live. 
it, it's a school teacher and then there's a principal above it. I'm just wondering who's the <laughs> principal, who, who's, you know what I mean? Who's dictating? Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot of forces out there. No, I'm so glad this conversation went this way because I think everyone who understands who's seen through the propaganda of the health stuff is seen through sick care is seen through all the agendas out there. They understand everything you just said as well, right? They, they understand history. They understand where this is headed. And I'm just glad that everyone's kind of on the same page. I haven't really met someone who like gets all the nutrition stuff and doesn't kind of get the rest of the stuff. And man, we are like, going down two divergent paths in society. I always say that nowadays too. It's like, there's going to be the society of the Wally people on the scooters eating the the fake foods. And then there's going to be guys like Dr. Anthony over here looking like a beast, you know, like we're over here just like eating meat, like growing our own food, being healthy. And I don't know they're going to come, how they're going to stop that. <laughs> but yeah. man, Wait, we got to get back to some nutrition stuff real quick, though, before we go. <laughs> we can go on forever about this stuff. Uh, I want to talk about fruit, though, because, you know, you, you gave kind of your argument that fruit, it's kind of a drug, it's sugar, the plant want, tricks us into eating it. I, I don't know about that. So mm. I, I think this is, it's like the highly prized foods are basically meat and fruit. These also, fruit has the lowest anti-nutrients. It's, mm. yeah, well, you know what I mean? It's like, it, I think it's sweet, a, sweet fruits, though. Sweet fruits have lower anti-nutrients, right? But I mean, I, I, I've been eating sweet fruits for over a year now and I, I've not gained a pound. I've, no, I feel better. Yeah, yeah no, that's better. fine. Yeah, no. So, so the thing is, is that, is that, is that the thought is that evolutionarily, uh, fructose is like the sweetest carbohydrate because we recognize it as safe, you know, because we don't, we don't know of anything containing fructose that uh, is like acutely poisonous for people. So you're right. It has, it has way less anti-nutrients. But I would argue that fructose is an anti-nutrient. You know, we, we know from uh, the biochemistry department at UCSF Medical School uh, back in 2009 and, and subsequently that um, it actually mapped out the biochemistry of fructose uh, as it metabolizes in our body, that it is broken down in the liver into the same byproducts as ethanol. And so we get the same damage from those byproducts as the byproducts of ethanol. And so we get fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, diabetes, heart disease, and it's even implicated in, in cancer and uh, Alzheimer's. So certainly it, it provides an advantage uh, to giving us a, a, like a hit of energy and, and we know it's safe. And so likely is our ancestors sort of the ones that were recognizing this as like, oh, okay, that, that tastes okay. Remember, you think everything goes back to taste, right? So if something tastes bitter, you know, that can't, that can't be good for you, right? Because your, your brain and your tongue are sophisticated machines and recognizing harmful chemicals. That's why it tastes bad, you know? And so sometimes we cook things and denature them and change them. And so we don't taste them as much like why a boiled potato tastes sort of bland, but a raw potato is really bitter and really gross. Um, fruit, sweet fruit, uh, can be sort of recognized as that. It's like this, this safe hit of energy. But again, you know, our, our, you know, we're talking optimal, right? So is that, is that an optimal part of our nutrition or is that, you know, a, a hit of energy that's safe, that allows us to survive so that we can then go get our normal meal because long-term, you know, fructose can cause, cause harm. Um, also you, the fruit, well, okay, sorry? Back to, sorry, before you move on the fructose stuff, cause I don't know all this science I'm, I'm getting into this more. I've had a few guests on recently talking about that it's it's a bit like cholesterol blaming cholesterol f you know for our problems when that's not the problem it's actually the processed foods and sugars same thing with fructose like fructose gets kind of this blame and it's yes of course if we study these sick people eating seed oils and eating a bunch of processed foods and then fructose is a problem but if you're just eating meat and fruit there is no problem um, I mean, potentially, I mean, we don't necessarily know that for a fact though. There was a study that just came out recently looking at fruit and it was, it was a controlled trial and they said, you know, this group sort of eat the same thing and this group sort of eat, eat, but eat four or more servings of fruit and this other group eat two or less servings of fruit. And, and these were already in metabolically sick people though. So, so to your point, you know, these people were already sick. Um, and the ones in the, they were eating more fruit 
their metabolic syndrome and their fatty liver disease got worse and the ones that were eating less got better. So they actually did see that disparity, but in people who are already sick. So, you know, your point was that if people are healthy and only eating meat, then, then maybe it's not as bad. Probably isn't as bad. I, I'm, I, I don't disagree with you on that. Um, but you know, you, you can, you can build it up, you know, and, and the fruit of the past that, you know, we had access to previously, uh, wasn't as sweet as it is now, you know, it has been, you know, you know, bred and cultivated to be more sweet because we enjoy that, that sweet yeah. flavor. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Robert Lustig, I don't know if you, have you come across him? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, he, so he, he's done like, you know, a ton of work on fructose and, you know, showing just how damaging it is. And, and, you know, this is, this is, um, you know, you know, just actually hard biochemistry. So we, we just know how fructose, you know, works in our body and is processed by our liver. So that that's fructose from table sugar. Or that's fructose from fruit as well. Now, now Lustig as well thinks that fruit's probably okay because first of all, for the fiber, because fiber actually reduces the amount of fructose that you absorb. So if you're eating fibrous, uh, you know, fruit, you're going to be absorbing less fructose. Fine. You know, if you're drinking fruit juices, well, you don't have that, uh, that benefit and you're going to get a lot more, you know, sugar and, and, and fructose in at, at the same time. Um, you know, poison is dose dependent. So if you're, you know, eating a bunch of, you know, processed foods and sugars and things like that, that have added sugar, you're going to get, you're just going to get a ton more sugar, you know, mm-hmm. but you know, people that are eating fruit, there's, um, now I, I, this wasn't necessarily studied, but, you know, I was talking to uh, a colleague of mine, uh, who was from India. He was a doctor from India. And I was talking to him about the, the, the fructose research when it, when it came out, I was sort of talking to him probably about 10 years ago. And he was saying that he was like, you know, that that's interesting because there's a, a region in India, uh, where he comes from that like the mangoes just grow like three months out of the year. They just, just grow like crazy. And, uh, and they just grow wild and like everybody around just, just eats mangoes. Like, like that's all they eat for like three months. Mm-hmm. And that area of India also has the highest rates of type two diabetes. And so the, the Indian government actually restricted the amount of mangoes that they were allowed to eat. Now that's, that's just, you know, mm-hmm. anecdotal. No, I, I don't know mm-hmm. of anybody who studied that and chronicled it and whatever, but it's interesting. And I think that you can, you can probably get enough, even if you're just eating meat and, and fruit, you could, if you're just eating a ton of things like mangoes, which are very, very sweet, um, the cultivated mangoes are obviously the original mangoes were actually not that sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, but if you're eating, if you're eating these ones, you can get, you can get, um, uh, you know, quite a lot of, of sugar and fructose, which eventually will cause harm. I don't think that, um, it's going to cause harm right away. And I, I think mm-hmm. that you can, you can probably be fine, you know, just eating some fruit every now and then, or even every day, if it's not that much, but I don't, I don't necessarily think it's optimal. Um, just one of the, one of the reasons I don't, I don't even drink milk, uh, is because it has enough lactose to raise your blood sugar and raise your insulin, which will sort of shut down your biochemistry and stop your body from mobilizing fat stores as readily. And so, you know, eating fruit that can also do that to a certain extent, depending on how much you eat. So just thinking about things optimally, I would, I would still say that, you know, avoiding fruit, but yeah, you're right. You know, sweet fruit is much less toxic than other things. But, you know, there are other fruits like, you know, tomatoes are fruit. They're also a nightshade. And so these actually have, you know, a lot more defense chemicals as well. So it's, it's the fructose containing plants, uh, that, you know, are, are thought to be safer and have much, much less defense chemicals. I totally agree with that. But fruit in general, isn't necessarily what you want to do. Like, you know, we're talking about the cassowary bird and the fruits they eat, they eat, all they eat is tropical fruits. Those fruits will kill you Mm -hmm. stone dead. You know, uh, think of all the berries in the world, you know, like, you know, the different native tribes that, you know, don't eat the red berries, right. You know, like a lot of berries, you know, which are fruit, you know, are, are poisonous because the plant wants something to eat them. It doesn't necessarily want us to eat them. You know, it wants the, you know, these specific trees want a cassowary bird to eat them, but you know, anything else and that, that seed will go wanting and it won't be, and won't turn into a tree. So it's, it's trying to protect that. So I think it's nuanced, you know, I, I, I certainly don't want to say, you know, just, you know, that, 
that, you know, all, all fruit is, you know, awful and horrible and this, that, and the other. I think that, that sweet fruit is absolutely safer than, Mm -hmm. than, you know, other plants in general. Um, but that fruits in general don't necessarily want our species to eat them. Mm -hmm. Um, but that too much fruit will allow you to absorb a, you know, too much fructose and that that fructose can cause harm. So that's what I'm trying to say, but it is, yeah, it's definitely more nuanced than, than just, than just that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and with the mango thing, I mean, yeah, anything in excess, if you're adding a whole bunch of mango to like a pretty bad diet anyway, of course it's always gonna be worse. It's the same arguments that vegans will use. It's like, if you're eating a junk food, processed food, American diet, and then you eat more meat, you're probably going to do worse but it's not the meat's fault. It's yeah, yeah, just yeah. Have this baseline of garbage. No, I know what you mean. I'm, I'm, I've been looking at all sides of this. I, I've been all over the place in the past nine years trying to figure out what mm-hmm. to do. And I don't want to get tied to anything, but I always want to be open to, you know, listening to the other camps because there are other nutrition camps that have very similar ideas about eating animal foods and how beneficial they are. And they, you know, these super healthy people and they work with clients and they get healthier and then they're using fruits and maybe sweet potatoes and, you know, milk and stuff. So it's like, so how does this work? I always want to figure out how it works. Right. It's like, cause I think some people just, yeah, you, you get into your, your camp and then you're just blind to the other things that could be going on. And I don't want to end up like the vegans, you know what I mean? Where they're just like, this is, yeah. this is the way it is and nothing else can change. But, yeah. but okay. So, so people I've come across who do say keto or carnivore or heavy meat, these diets for too long. Some of them, they end up with thyroid problems or they have cold hands and feet. They have sleep issues, lower body temperature, this stuff. What do you think is going on there? Yeah. Uh, it, it's a good question. I think that it's something that needs to be looked into. And, um, and I, I totally agree with you. I think that you need to keep an open mind and, you know, I, I often look at, uh, at people that I don't agree with, even in like vegans, uh, you know, doctors and, and, um, uh, you know, scientists and things like that and researchers when they talk about, okay, what am I missing? You know, you know, these guys are saying plant-based is the way to go. Great. What, what are their arguments? I want to know what they are because I, I, I you know, I, I don't, I don't care you know, uh, what the answer is ultimately. I just want to know what the answer is. I just want, I just want to have the right information for my own health and, you know, to recommend, uh, you know, to my patients. Um, so I think it's very important to keep an open mind. I totally agree with that. And I think it would be very interesting to get, you know, have a study of looking at people just eating meat and meat and fruit versus just eating meat or whatever, uh, you know, healthy people starting from a healthy point and see if there's any, any significant clinical endpoints. Um, you know, I think that I think I remember Saladino asked, uh, Gundry cause Gundry was saying, look, you know, fructose, bad idea. And fr- fructose is a seven day Adventist and says, you know, you should actually be eating a lot of plants, but he was saying, you know, probably shouldn't be eating fruit. And, you know, Saladino made the point. It was like, okay, well, you know, are there any studies showing that the, f- the fructose and fruit or honey causes the same damage as, as fructose from, you know, other, other sweetener sources. And you, know, and you couldn't do that. There aren't any studies that show that, but you know, the, the, the converse is also true. You know, there, there aren't any studies that I know of that show that, uh, you know, the, the fructose from fruit and honey is actually okay. You know, I mean, there's certainly things in fruit and honey that are going to be beneficial for you. Um, but, but like you say, you know, that's, that's not that. That's not to say that that it all comes under that same cast. You know, there could be. You know, the fructose could be uh, doing something differently as well. Um, so I think that's that would be something interesting to study. I, I think that would be a worthwhile study. Um, so as far as as far as you know, people boxing their thyroid and their hormones, that is an interesting issue because you don't see it in in, in all, everyone. It's not that it's not like the vegans where you get at past you know sort of year six, seven, eight you know, just the wheels start coming off, you know? Um, but some people do have problems on a carnivore diet. I have not had a problem on a carnivore diet. I've, I've done this for the last five years straight. And I did for five years in my early twenties, pure, 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 pure. And I've never had that problem. And I've had my hormones checked. I've had my, you know, uh, steroid binding globulin checked. I've had my testosterone and, and IGF one checked and, and my thyroid, everything is in optimal ranges. And, um, and that's after years and years and years of doing this. 
So I'm doing something that, that seems to work. I'm just eating skeletal muscle meat. I don't eat a, a, a lot of organs. Um, I know that other people do. And um, maybe there's something with that. There could, you know, it's, it's you know, sort of, you know, going around in circles that, that possibly this could be hypervitaminosis, hypervitaminosis A, so too much vitamin A it is known to suppress thyroid stimulating hormone. So you suppress thyroid stimulating hormone, you're going to produce less, you know, you know, thyroid uh, hormone. Okay. So that, that's a potential, uh, that's a potential mechanism there. There's no, there's, I don't have any proof of that, you know, but you know, this is, this is something that you could think about. The, the main thing is just sort of thinking at first principles, you know, what are we as an animal? Biologically, we have lived as Mickey Bendor showed for 2 million years as apex predators. So if ketosis puts us into a position where that doesn't we are, mean we didn't eat fruit along the way. I mean, I was with no, the true, hundred percent, yeah, I mean, but as a staple of our diet, you know, during the no, ice I, ages, I I'm not saying the staple of the not. diet. Either, yeah. Yeah. No, but, but that, but that's what I'm saying. hundred percent. I think, I, I, I don't think for a second that our ancestors didn't eat some plant material and, and fruit every now and then. I, I, I don't think that's, um, you know, a, a question, honestly, I think that, you know, that's probably one of our, our, our survival mechanisms is that we were able to sort of eat these sorts of things. And, and you know, if we were in a time of privation, we could, we could do that. But, you know, there, there, you know, when, when our ancestors grew up in the, in the ice sheets hunting mammoths, there really wasn't going to be fruit available or, or honey, you know, when, um, you know, people were crossing the land bridge from Asia over to North America, you know, probably wasn't going to be, you know, any, any fruit and honey available there. Now I'm not saying that, you know, you eat fruit and honey, you're going to die. I'm saying that I don't think it's, it's necessary. I don't think that it's vital. I don't think that, um, if you don't eat it, you're going to tank your organs, which is, which is the argument that's being made. And that's why I sort of made that, that, uh, um, you know, made that point is that people are saying that not only is it okay to eat fruit and honey, but that you actually need to that this is important for your, your hormonal health and your organ health. I don't think that that can really be said when you're seeing populations, you know, like the Inuit and, and, you know, uh, you know, previous populations going back in history where they didn't really even have access to it. Now, maybe they ate fruit and, and plants every now and then when they had access to it, but, you know, in the ice times, when you're crossing, you know, the Bering Strait on the land bridge, the, the, arguably was not going to be any available, you know, probably for generations. And so well, when you have low well, fiber, maybe that wasn't optimal though. Just to- yeah, yeah. Oh, hundred oh, percent. You know, and yeah, fine. But I'm, but what I'm saying is that when you're talking about thyroid, thyroid is a very, very important hormone. So thyroid hormone, if you have low thyroid, uh, you die if you, if it goes low enough, but even when it's, it's just suboptimal, if you have a woman who has low thyroid while she's pregnant, that seriously disrupts the, the development of the baby. It's actually, it's actually called cretinism. You know, like some of the best insults uh, that we have are actually like, you know, medical terms, you know, and, and that's what people started calling them. Uh, you know, people are like, oh, you cretin. Like that, that was a medical term. People had very short stature. They had very distinctive uh, facial deformities and they were quite significantly intellectually delayed. So, you know, if you had these people not living optimally, not having proper use of their thyroid, even to not to an extent that they, was go- they were going to die, their kids are going to get cretinism. You know, so, you know, that's going to be difficult for that next generation, you know, and then you have, you have a population where now they're, they're really sort of hurt by this, by this congenital, uh, congenital hypothyroidism. And, uh, and, and, you know, and then they are going to have low thyroid and you have kids, you know, and more kids and more kids that are, that are affected by this. So it, it is a, it's a big deal, but, you know, even, even, um, you know, just, just people like myself and there's other people that have been, you know, like the keto movement has been around for 20 years, you know, and, and been very popular, uh, for much of that time. And so there have been people that have been keto much longer than I've been carnivore and, uh, you know, and they, they haven't run into these problems as well. So I don't know why that's caused, uh, that happens in some people, but I do know that it doesn't happen in everyone. 
you know, it hasn't happened in myself or Dr. Baker or, or other people. Um, Kelly Hogan, who's been doing this for, you know, over a decade and, you know, many other people in the carnivore community that have been doing this for a very long time. And, you know, they haven't had these problems. So I don't know what it is, but I, I don't, I, I can't really attribute it to not eating carbohydrates because I haven't eaten carbohydrates in five years and, and my thyroid hormone is perfect. You know, I have, I have, I have the blood test to prove it, you know? So it's, um, I don't know exactly what it is. I think it's something that we should look into, but I don't think that it's, uh, from being in ketosis for too long, just because there are a lot of people in ketosis for a long time. You know, um, professor Bart K argues that it's probably to do with, um, not eating like a big enough bolus meal in one go. Like if you eat a, a you know, big, big, big meal of, of meat and steak in one go, you'll get a transient blip of your blood sugar, which will kick you out of ketosis, which will, you know, you know change things biochemically. You'll be able to, you know, uh, you know, uh, modulate, you know, some of your biochemistry a little better. And, um, and so that, that transient flip out of ketosis is, is, is all you need, uh, to, to get the benefits of that. And, you know, maybe that's true. You know, maybe, maybe that's it. You know, maybe people are eating, you know, smaller meals throughout the day and they're not getting that big bolus that's, that's, that's kicking things off. I'm not sure, but I do know that other people aren't having that problem. So there's something different happening, you mm-hmm. know, but it, I don't yeah. think it's the addition of, of carbs. Yeah, no, I, I see all sides of this stuff. And I, I just, I know there's all these carnivore people that have done it for many years. I know Kelly and it's just, well, maybe this is this, the survivorship bias. It's like, these are the people that, that magically have the genetics or that have been doing something to make it work. But maybe. we can't just say that it's them. And also I I'm starting to look into the Inuit. I think they have a different polymorphism that allows them you know, they have mm-hmm. the certain genetics that really are adapted to living like that. And maybe other people don't. So that's another pushback I've heard. And yeah, I mean, the thyroid, I'm not saying people need carbs. I'm just kind of like just saying, well, maybe look at the opposite is I know a lot of people, maybe it's who I'm exposed to lately that heal from all the thyroid problems by just adding fruit. You know what I mean? It's not saying that fruit is necessary, but for maybe a lot of people, <clears throat> they have these problems, they add some fruit, they f- and then their blood markers get better. All these things get better. Thyroid gets better. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, maybe more, even more for women, like people talk about, you know, the difference between men and women and women, maybe their cycle and needing more carbohydrates, all this type of stuff. seems like most women I've talked to they're they are not doing well on pure carnivore and a specific girl I know just sent me her blood work and, or talked about it at least and how much better it got once she started eating more of the, you know, like raw milk and fruit and honey and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Did she, was she eating organs as well or just muscle meat? Uh, it was about the same. I mean, she, I think she's organs from time to time. It's not like a huge, it, it was never, yeah, that, that wasn't a, a difference. Portion. She was very, very healthy before mm-hmm. and after and very into diet and life, you know, lifestyle and doing all the right things. And it was a good control experiment of doing it pretty carnivore for a number of years and then pretty sort of pro metabolic, I guess you'd call it with the fruit and the honey and the, the raw milk and stuff. And, and she already had amazing blood work. Like I, you know, the mm-hmm. HDL was amazing. It just got a little bit better. It was just cool. It was like, Oh wow. Okay. After all this, it just got a little better and it's like sleep better, you know, like just all these little things. I just want to throw it out there. Cause I don't, I don't know. I don't want to, to, to like tell me what to do or to like start arguments with people or yeah. to say that one, what one diet is better. Cause I don't know. I'm on the journey too. And I, yeah. it's like, yeah, maybe like five years ago, I thought I had it all figured out. And now I look back, I'm like, wow, I didn't know anything back then. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, there, there's, there can always be, you know, new information that comes out and, you know, drastically changes your mind. And, you know, and, and I, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, if she feels better doing something like that and her blood markers are improving and she's feeling healthier, I mean, like do it, like, you know, go for it. You know, this, this is what works best for me. And I've certainly noticed that I feel the best when I'm, when I'm as pure as I can be, you know, maybe that that's, uh, you know, just me, but, um, you know, it is interesting. Um, and you know, one, one of the things too, is that, you know, if, if you are eating organs and, and the thing is obviously, you know, there is not, you know, there's a couple pounds of liver in a cow 
and but there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of skeletal muscle meat and fat so if you're if you're hunting this in the wild or you even buy a cow um you know buy a whole cow you know that meat will last you two years for one person and you're going to have one liver for those two years so it's it's a it's a very vanishingly small amount of of organs proportionately that that you'll get you know per animal for the amount of meat that you're going to be getting um so you know it is possible that you know people could eat overeat uh some organs and they could get hypervitaminosis a for example they could you know sort of diminish their t- uh, thyroid stimulating hormone um carbohydrates have been known when you eat carbohydrates they can actually increase your demand for certain vitamins and so you know that's something that you know professor ben bickman talks about you know when you when you eat carbs you just actually need more vitamins yeah. and um sorry was it ben bickman or um no sorry it was, it was dr uh, baylor step Dr. Baylor said was saying that, you know, he does, he's a a forage agronomy, PhD in forage agronomy and and animal and has a a degree in animal nutrition as well. And and he was talking about that. And so, you know, it, it could be theoretically, and obviously I don't know, but I'm just saying this is just theoretically that if you got into a state of hypervitaminosis and, you know, you have carbohydrates, which increase your body's demand for said vitamins that by eating carbohydrates, you can actually raise your threshold and need for these vitamins, which actually makes it so you're not in hypervitaminosis anymore. You're actually in a normal level and you will definitely feel better. That's just a theoretical, you know, but I, I'm, you know, I, I, I try to sort of look around because like, like you, I'm just trying to figure out, okay, why, why is this working differently for me as it is for someone else? You know, what are we doing differently? You know, and they're eating carbs and they get better. Okay. But I've, I've never eaten carbs. So I don't think that's the difference, you know, between us, you know, and that's one difference that I've seen is that there, you know, there are people that eat a lot of organs and really say that this is, this is really, um, you know, what you really need to be doing is eating a lot of organs. And, you know, some of them seem to be having these same problems. And so that's just something that I've sort of thought about. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm on the same page as you with the organs. I love my company's called nose tail. Like I'm all about eating the animal nose tail, but I'm on the same page as you is that means there's one liver per animal. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I don't go beyond that. I, I do do the ratios. And I think that's why nose tail is good is you're getting the ratio of the, the rest of the animal, like the bone marrow or the, the gristly bits and the glycine and, you know, collagenous stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's why I eat that too, because I think that's part of what we did throughout history is, mm eat it in the correct ratio. So definitely on the same page as you, you want to eat it in the right ratios. And yeah, I, I don't know. Um, we got to go that we could, we could talk about this <laughs> endlessly, but maybe before we go, there's another controversial thing is, is grain fed versus grass fed. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Before I want to wrap up the, the organ thing. I know way more people who never eat organs that have problems. Just, I'm talking about, I talk to people every mm-hmm. day about this stuff. I'm making this film, you know, it's all I do. Yeah, of course. So most people do not eat organs, right? Mm-hmm. And they are the ones that are saying they have the problems with the thyroid. So okay. Interesting. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know many people who actually eat organs other than Paul Saladino yeah. and Liver King. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, these guys are like sort of the, the extremes, but yeah, I, I wouldn't blame on that. But I guess right. to get yeah, back to my question, grain versus grass fed, because I think it's a nuanced topic too. People may think just because I have a grass finished regenerative meat company that I'm like all about it. You can only eat grass finished mm-hmm. or you're going to die. That's not the case. I, I'm I'm open to this discussion. So please tell me what you think. Yeah. Well, I think that um, I, I think that you you can make a very good argument that, you know, the healthier an animal is, the healthier it's going to be for you. Um, and, uh, you know, when, it, when an animal is eating what it's supposed to eat, it's going to be, you know, packed with a lot of nut- nutrients because plants contain defense chemicals. Um, if an animal is adapted to that, that plant and it can break those down efficiently and effectively, well, less of those things are going to carry over into the meat. So you could suppose that if, you know, a cow is not really evolved to eat grain, well, maybe some of those things are slipping through. Maybe this is changing the nutrition profile of the meat. Uh, I know that um, I, I was watching a lecture from uh, Dr. Paul Mason over in Sydney. He's a mm-hmm. very, very uh, interesting guy. I, I think everyone should should go look at his stuff. 
um, you know, he was showing that when you grain finish a cow, it starts to actually lose some of its omega threes. And that after about three months of, of, uh, grain feeding a cow, it has, uh, you know, significantly less omega threes, maybe even, you know, runs out of omega threes at about that point, uh, and, and will have more predominantly more omega sixes. So that, that's, that's a difference in profile, but I'm, I'm definitely with you in, in that. I think that, that grain finished beef is perfectly fine. I, that's, I mostly eat grain finished. I like grass finished. I, when I was in America, I, I bought a, a cow that was 10 years old, which is amazing by the way. I think if you, if you, you have the opportunity to find a, an older cow, do it because they taste awesome. There's much more concentrated beef flavor, especially the grass fed one. Uh, you know, the, the, the fat was just dark yellow and it just had this, this freshness to it. It just smelled differently. It was, it was amazing. And I, I just felt just supercharged every time I ate it. That was a very different experience than even eating normal meat, which I loved. Right. Um, so I noticed the difference. I think that, um, you know, there are, you know, differences in, in nutrition as well, but I think you, you are, you will thrive on grain, grain fed cows as well. Um, it just may not be as good. The way I think about it is, is sort of like gold and silver medalists at the Olympics. You know, silver lost to gold, but silver also beat everyone else on earth, you know? So you're, you're not going to go, uh, you're not really going to go wrong by going grain finish. And, and that's the thing too. A lot of people find uh, this sort of diet uh, prohibitively expensive because they go for the, the highest end, highest quality, grass fed, grass finished, super top shelf, whole foods, sort of beef and it's super expensive when you do it that way and and obviously that's not that's not possible for for uh, many people to do and so I, I don't think you need to I don't think you need to do that in order to have a very good uh, result and outcome um, you know I was talking to uh, Sean Baker about this and he was saying that um, you know there there you know, have been, you know, some studies and they didn't really find a difference in, uh, objective health outcomes, uh, between grass fed and, and, uh, grass finished and grain finished beef. So, you know, objectively, you know, at the end of the day, it's really not making a, 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 as much of a difference, um, objectively with the, whatever markers they were looking at. I didn't, I didn't see the study myself, so I don't know what those were, but, uh, whatever it was, they didn't seem to find, uh, a, a big enough difference between those two, uh, to say that, oh, wow, this one is much better than the other. I think, I, I think objectively you have to say that grass fed is going to be better just because it's going to have a different nutrition profile. I mean, just the omega threes, for instance, that's, that's a difference, you know? And so, you know, but I think it's perfectly fine to eat, eat grain finished, but you know, if you can get, if you can get grass fed, grass finished, especially like older, older cows, I would, I would highly recommend it. I felt awesome eating that stuff and it tasted great. Well, yeah, there's a hundred reasons why you should do that. Even just to support your local ranchers, support, mm. re, you know, the replenishment of the soil nutrients and regenerative ag to fight the big food systems, to have the extra nutrition, the diverse diet that they're eating. I did a podcast with Dr. Stefan von Vliet that studies this stuff. And there are all these secondary compounds. There's like 70,000 secondary compounds that we don't even know how they all work. And that we just know that they're more in the grass-fed meat. And it's because mm -hmm. it's very easy to figure out. They're eating this diverse diet of all these different forages and the cows are out there, especially on instead of just, you know, there's a difference between monocropped grass you know what I mean? Just like one big strip of the same grass and so a cow eating a diverse forage diet, which is even better, right? So yes, there's so many reasons to do it, but I think you're making a good point because I, I really push back against the people that try to fear monger around normal meat hmm. because so many people need that normal meat. So many people are deterred from eating grocery store meat because there's all this fear mongering and it goes even from carnivores to vegan propaganda and everyone in between is basically trying to make it sound like it's this this steak you get at a grocery store is going to kill you i'm like no it's yeah, not yeah, we gotta yeah. stop this. like we wouldn't it wouldn't be safe to eat the usda I, I don't agree with the usda a lot of the time but i mean they do have standards and they do you know like if there's antibiotics you cannot eat the meat for like i don't know they have these washout periods it's like it's not 
they make sure where it's not still in the animal. Yeah. And maybe people are, are going to be mad that I'm talking about this because I'm going against their beliefs and I'm going against my own company's <laughs> <laughs> beliefs almost. But I'm just saying, man, gra uh, grocery store meat is fine. It's not going to kill you. It's healthier than 99% of the stuff in the grocery store because people's got to eat something. So if you're telling them grocery meat meat's going to kill them, grocery store meat will kill them. Well, what are they going to eat? Then they're just like, oh, okay, I will have to be vegetarian or like, this is the way to go. I'm going to eat my whole grain pasta and my vegetables because this meat's going to kill me. Yeah. No, 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 de no, definitely not. No. And, and the whole antibiotics and hormones and food is, is a bit of a fallacy as well. Like, just like you say, you know, there's really not, you're not going to find like a lot of antibiotics in it, uh, when you, when you process it, because you know, why, why would it, um, make a fiscal sense to give an injection of something that costs you money right before you're going to slaughter an animal? That doesn't make any damn sense. You know, you give that to the animal six months ago so that it's healthy and has a higher weight when, when it's ready to slaughter. Same with the hor hormones. You put hormones in this thing while it's growing so it can grow up to a certain weight and then you, you know, you can process it. It's a waste of money to give, you know, uh, you know, hormones and antibiotics, you know, so close to the date of, uh, of slaughter that, that it's going to still be in the meat. So that, that's, um, you know, whether or not someone's trying to do right by you and, and give you the healthiest product ever, it, it wouldn't make sense for them financially. So if they're just greedy, horrible, you know, money grubbing, whatever, they're just worried about turning a profit then they're definitely not doing that mm -hmm. because that would, that would be a waste of money. Again, yeah. you know? But still, I still want to say there are problems. I'd rather them not be fed antibiotics and hormones. <laughs> hmm. And I get it. There's a lot going on and there's problems, but just, you know what I mean? There's other problems. I, I don't even want to get into all these problems because <laughs> it's kind of like vegan propaganda stuff, but it's like 90, you know, 80% of the antibiotics go to livestock and all this stuff. And it could be, it could be creating like, you know, like, antibiotic resistance and stuff yeah maybe there is some stuff happening if you if you are yeah. you know what i mean like i'd rather it not be like that i'd rather them not be in feedlots but feedlots are not cages you know these cows mm -hmm. are out on grass for the first two thirds of their life and i don't know there it's such a nuanced topic and I, i'm already making enemies just talking about it <laughs> but uh i just want to let people know that there's like 80 percent of the masses out there that probably aren't listening to this podcast they're, they need to know that it's safe to eat regular meat. The top 20% or maybe the top 1% of people who are into health who are probably listening to this podcast, absolutely. Eat the grass finish, get the best stuff, support the ranchers, support notes to tail, 100%. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. And and uh, yeah, but I, I think it's important to, you know, not, yeah, not discourage people, you know, if, um, you know, that don't throw away the good for the perfect, you know, like, you know, like if, if, if it's possible to get, you know, great, you know, if it's possible to, you know, hunt a deer in the woods and, um, you know, and get that, you know, like, I think that's, that's probably even better, but, you know, uh, certainly supporting your local farmers and ranchers. I think that's, that's very important, especially now when, when things are being, uh, very, very strange and, uh, and, and they're trying to put these, these guys out of business, unfortunately. Um, that's, a, that's important to do. It's not only important just for our health, but, you know, we need to support these sorts of, of industries because, you know, the more we support them, the more of them there will be for us in the future. And if there is a market for these things and people say like, hey, you know, like there's a lot of people eating meat, they want meat, that's what they want. I'm going to fill that demand. You know, it's, it's in their best interest to meet our demand and to, and to make more meat and more meat products. And, you know, if, if the more we support these things and support these, these avenues, the better that's going to be for everybody down the road. And so I think that that's very, very important. And, uh, yeah, I, I certainly like, um, how I feel on, on grass finished sort of beef. It's, it's a bit of a bitch to get sometimes, you know, and, uh, especially here in Australia. So it's, um, you know, so I, I, you know, I just go to Costco and I just, I just buy meat in bulk and I feel great. So, you know, it's, um, uh, it's, I don't, you know, I think that, uh, that's a, that's a common one that people, 
get worried about, you know, and they try to try to break the bank just buying the, the perfect cuts of meat. You don't have to like meat of any description, you know, bought in, in a Western country and grocery store is going to be safe and is going to be very, very, very nutritious. And it's certainly going to be more nutritious than any plant that's in that store. So, you know, even if it's not the ideal cut of meat, it's still, you know, better than any of the alternatives. I love it. We may have just got the highlight for the episode right there. The last line there. All right. Dr. Anthony Chafee doing well, looking strong, playing rugby, lifting weights, doing neurosurgery, eating all meat for five years. And I guess you said five years, 20 years ago you did as well. Yeah. So like 10 of the last 20 years I've been yeah, strict carnivore and otherwise I've been very, very meat centric where I've, I've predominantly eaten, you know, some people call themselves like hyper carnivores and they eat more than 70% uh, meat by calories. Like I, I think I've done that since birth. <laughs> so like, and, uh, and then there's like a couple, a couple episodes of, of pure strict carnivore. And then that, then that's where I'm going to be. I, 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 I do not plan on eating any plants unless I, I need to, to survive. You know, if I have access to meat, I'll be eating meat. I love it and do what's working. It, it, it's working well. And uh, I appreciate this talk. And man, where can people find you? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's just Anthony Chafee MD. Um, and so that's, that's where I, I do a lot of videos in my podcast uh, videos on there. And I have, um, you know, my podcast is just called The Plant Free MD. And I, so I put the audio version of that up on, you know, Apple and Spotify. Um, and then just mostly other on, um, Instagram. So I have an Instagram, it's just Anthony Chafee MD. And so I, I, I do a lot of posts there as well. And, uh, I have a website, uh, the where I'm going to start. I'm, I'm, it's in the process of being built, but I have a lot of blogs and, and writings that I've done, um, and, and sort of parts of chapters of the book I'm writing on, on how basically arguing that so-called chronic diseases that we treat these days are not diseases per se, but actually, caused by, you know, the food that we eat or don't eat, you know, so we're getting buildup of toxins and we're not getting enough nutrition. So it's toxicities and malnutrition. Um, and then I just started a, a, like a Patreon as well. I could put out, you know, independent, uh, content there and, and early releases as well as, uh, you know, just, just patron only sort of content. And, uh, that's that, uh, just Anthony Chafee MD. So those are the main ones. That's great. We'll link to all of those. Thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to talking to you soon. I guess I'll be on your show soon. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next week. All right. We'll see yeah. you soon, man. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.